lead songs and go right to a solo. I know that. So Brother Dalton, thank you for doing that. Great job. If you have your Bibles, you would open to the book of 2 Corinthians tonight. 2 Corinthians, as we continue on our, on our thought on the battle, the spiritual battle, and tonight, again, the battle within. We all face spiritual battles. The last few weeks we've been talking about that, looking at the Scripture because of that. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Too often we attribute our battles to what's around us. To someone, a face or something, an object, to some hardship. But the fact is, the Bible explains was clearly that we as Christians are in a spiritual battle. We are spiritual so soldiers. Second Corinthians, the Bible again, deals with something that happens on the inside of us. I did not realize as I prepared this series and the one from this morning, they would tie so closely together. This morning we looked at what happens when we're overwhelmed from Psalms chapter number 3. Tonight, along with that, as we look at the battle within or the battle in our heart and mind, controlling thoughts and emotions can be a difficult process. Some think it's, feel that it's even impossible. Everyone struggles to some degree with some type of thoughts that don't please the Lord. For some, it may be thoughts of anger. Some people seem to be wired one step away from explosion. If you're married to this person, do not raise your hand. If you are this person, you're allowed to raise your hand. But for others, it's discouragement. And they're one step away from depression. I call it the Eeyore sy syndrome. Those who remember that old, that old show. Everything is down and low. For others, it is bitterness. And they're one hurt away from stopping everything in life. There were years ago that I was talking to a, to a couple to encouraging them to come to my young couples class. And they didn't use the typical excuses of, I'm busy, I can't get the kids up, that. No, they said, well, we can't go there because the person in your class hurt us years ago. When I asked how long ago it was, it worked out to be about 20 plus years earlier. They would not come to serve God now because of a hurt 20 years earlier. And we all have thoughts and thought patterns that we struggle with. For some, it may be anger or d bitterness or discouragement or depression. Others, it's sensuality or lustful thoughts. Others cling to heartache. Some to insecurities and to fear. But all of us have some battles within that are not fleshly battles, though they're in the flesh. And that's what Paul says when he says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, if you'd look please there, beginning in verse number 3, where Paul begins with that thought, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even as so are we Christ's. Lord, I thank you for your scripture, for your truth. Lord, thank you for the practicality that it brings to our life. Lord, those tonight who acknowledge they're struggling with some internal battle, a spiritual battle, Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize tonight the warfare that we're in and the weapons that you provide. Lord, help us to look to you for victory. Lord, may we not accept defeat. May we not continue to walk in failure. Lord, may we walk in faith. Lord, help me to communicate these truths clearly. Lord, if there's something that I prepared that I shouldn't say, please don't let me say it, Lord. And guide us. May we respond to your spirit and your word tonight. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Our battle within. 
Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes it looks like pettiness. I was reading the other day about, a, of course, you've heard this, maybe, maybe you have, about this new term for someone who at a store goes after the manager and they call her a Karen. Right, a Karen is described as a, as a lady. Ladies, no offense. It wasn't me. I did not originate this, so don't focus your Karen-like qualities at me for a second. <clears throat> and if your name is Karen, then I, I deeply apologize. Deeply apologize, Karen. I deeply apologize. Good to see the beaches back in tonight. Um, uh, but but the, the, the stereotypical Karen, okay, they say is someone who will get the nth degree at a, at a store, at a restaurant, going after the manager for every little thing, and, and in essence, being extremely petty. Extremely petty. I've met some people like that before. They wear on you. They grate on you. I've been at a store where I've watched someone berate the, the cashier to the point where I'm like, listen, let me give you the 50 cents now. Leave, please, because you're irritating me now. Right? Maybe you've seen these people before. Pettiness. There's all things we struggle with. Now, it is easy. It is natural. It is human to look at someone else's struggles and to make fun of, to make light of their individual struggles. The problems that you face are not nearly as severe as the problems that I face. Your problems are easily manageable. Mine, well, those are big problems. That's how we are. The ones you face, well, that's nothing. All right, deal with it. All right, just get over it. But mine, no, I need to work through this. You don't understand what I went through. It is natural, it is humanistic, it is fleshly to disregard someone else's battles, but our own battles, our own strongholds, if I may, we tend to protect, to make excuse for, to make light of, well, it's just something I'm working through. Really? So for the last 45 years you've worked through this? No, you're not working through this, you're enjoying it. Or you're failing in it. But you're not just working through it. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. This is the way I was raised. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. But just so you know, you were raised in this way the wrong way. Well, you don't understand how tough it is. You're right. I don't. I don't. I don't walk in your shoes. You don't walk in my shoes. God has called you to a certain path as, as he has called me to a certain path, and the struggles that I face will probably not be the struggles that you face. In our house, my wife and I, we struggle with different things. We're different, and it's a wonderful benefit that we have different strengths, but different struggles. We're all different, and we all have these battles within. And I want us to gain three truths tonight we look for victory in our battles. Number one, the first truth is this. Our battles may seem insurmountable. Our battles may seem to be insurmountable. Now, I'll just say right now, they are not insurmountable. Right? Victory is possible, but they may seem insurmountable. The Bible uses this word in verse number four. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of the word there is strongholds. You can call the stronghold, describe it like a castle or a fortress or something that has now been built up, something that has some fortification, something in my life and your life that has now become ingrained, something that has deep roots. Trying to get rid of some stumps around my house, and I was eventually successful. Apparently, the owners before me had left a, had a lot of trees, and I still have a lot at my house, but they had left 31 stumps, 31 in my yard. 31 stumps, and as I'm grinding these stumps down, before I ground them, I tried to get rid of them myself in a couple of other, other different ways. Do you know there are certain ways that you can't get rid of stumps? Now, I did not try this, but let me just tell you some ways you can't, all right? You cannot hook up a vehicle to a stump, typically, with a bumper and yank it out. It will not work. Years ago, we were removing some bushes from First Baptist Church. Pastor Scott's laughing. He remembers the story, and, and we had told a particular staff member, do not use a bus to rip these, these evergreen bushes out. They're in front of the school. We still have some bushes there. 
This young staff member did not listen to reason, did not listen to good advice. They hooked up chains to the bumper of a bus, promptly began to yank on this bush, and yanked off the bumper of the bus. There's only a few times in my life that I've seen Pastor Let not be happy. Uh, even, Pastor Scott Wright, maybe a little bit upset. Maybe even, like, really not happy. Like, I mean, if it was a lesser man, we'd say angry. All right, but not Pastor Let. He wasn't angry. But he was coming close in that territory right then. I learned something that day. Do not use a bus from First Baptist Church to yank out roots and bushes at First Baptist Church. Write that down. It's good advice right there. In our life, though, these particular habits, these, or maybe these mind struggles, begin, if we're not careful, to take root in our lives. And the roots run deep. They're not like grass. Boy, grass, if you look at it wrong, it's dead. Right? If you think about it wrong, it's dead. But weeds, trees, bushes, obnoxious plants, it's like their roots go down all the way to the center of the earth in one afternoon. And it seems that way in my life and your life that at times these struggles go very, very deep. And the Bible word there is strongholds. And the battles at times may seem to be insurmountable. That there's no clear path to victory. That no matter how I try, I look at this struggle, whether it be bitterness, whether it be depression, whether it be lustful thoughts, whether it be some bad habit or something else, I look at this thing, this internal battle, this battle within, and I don't think that victory is possible. I feel as if that this is insurmountable. I'm prone to failure then. Why not throw in the towel? I'm not going to win anyway. Why even try? I've tried for a lot of years. I've tried everything I can, Pastor. I've prayed a lot. I've come to the altar. And I've tried this. I've tried that. And I don't have victory yet. What they're saying is this battle seems insurmountable. Sometimes it's because the problem is so large. Hurt is so deep. It just drives down. See, sometimes our battles may seem to be insurmountable. The Bible word there is strongholds. Problem we just can't get over. An issue we just can't get out of our mind. You ever had something just gnaw the back of your mind? Just gnaw it? Keep on gnawing? Boy, we feel overwhelmed, we feel underprepared. At times we feel like we get victory, but then we still get bitten by it. I, I read that a rattlesnake can still bite you even with its head cut off. I did not know that. But I do remember Brother Ash on, on Man Up Camp got bit by a snake once. We were young in our lives. We were a lot younger than 40, and we were up there together, and there were some younger boys, some teenager boys, and Brother Ash was showing what a man he was, so there was a snake that they were running away from, and you killed it, I think. You didn't kill it. You did not kill it. But they were still scared. He picked up the dead snake, and he flung the dead snake, and as he flung the snake, it bit him. They can bite you still. We know Brother Trevor, doesn't like snakes. Write that down, what he, what he wants for Christmas, apparently. <laughs> they said, though, that last summer in a, in a certain city, five patients were brought in out west who were admitted because they'd been bitten by rattlers that were dead. But a snake whose head is cut off is a pretty good description of Satan, is it not? When Jesus rose in victory, he has defeated Satan. He has cut off his head, but sometimes he still bites. Get overwhelmed. Bitterness has etched an ugly mark. Depression, panic, anxiety disappointment, fear. Years ago, in Africa, a remote part of Africa, there was a village. And all the, the people of the village began to get sick. Then some began to pass. They went to the village and began to find out what was going on in this, this small African remote village. And they realized that the water supply was contaminated. They traced the water supply, as the story goes, back up the mountain from where the village got its water from. And it came from a spring, but the spring was perfectly clear and looked to be just fine. They decided to send some divers down into the 
mouth of the spring under water. When they did, these divers found that there was a mother pig and her piglets, baby piglets, had somehow fallen into this pool where the spring began and had gotten wedged right in the opening at the spring. And these pigs began to decompose underground, underwater there. It contaminated all the water. And though the water appeared to be bright and clear, it actually was deadly. In our life, if we're not careful, these strongholds will begin to poison us. If we're not careful, if we don't see the victory that God can give to us, these strongholds can destroy, can destroy an otherwise perfectly well-equipped Christian. Someone who appears to be clear and bright and clean, but inside there's a battle going on, and if we don't find victory, it can poison us and those around us. You see, our battles at times may seem to be insurmountable. You ever faced an insurmountable internal battle? Too hard, no way out. Our second thought I want you to think about is this tonight. At times, though, our weapons that God gives us may seem to be ineffective. The Bible says, for the weapons of our war warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And though our battles may seem to be, to be insurmountable, our weapons at times that God gives us may seem to be ineffective. But the weapons that we have, they're not carnal, not temporal. They're mighty, they're capable, they're eternal. Sometimes we attempt to fight the internal battle with external weapons. The internal battle here with external solutions. There's some that get so busy so their minds can't run away on them. We try to shove the things out of our mind. And maybe you've tried this one before. There's something plaguing you, something worrying you, so you just shove it out of your mind. How does that work out for you? Try to forget something. Try to forget your name. I will not remember J.D. Howell. I'm putting it out of my mind. I do not know who I am any longer. You can't do that, can you? At times you try to shove it out with a... With a with an external weapon, and it may help for a little bit, but it will not solve the problem. It will not bring victory. We ignore the problem, or we excuse <coughs> the issue. It's the way I am. I read about a man who grew up in a school where there was a bully. No one likes a bully. In fact, we want to fight against a bully. We don't like a bully, but this man was at school with a bully, and apparently this, this boy was having his lunch money stolen every day. What a travesty. So this man, when he was younger, he said, when I was smaller, I decided to give it to him. Then one day, I decided to fight back. It'd make a good movie, right? We like that, where the bully loses. So he decided to learn karate, way to defeat any, any bully in life. But then the karate lesson guy said I had to pay him $5 a lesson. He said, so I went back to paying the bully. Because it was easier to pay the bully than to learn how to defeat him. Let that sink in for just a moment, my friend. Because sometimes in our life, we decide to just pay the bully because it's easier to pay the bully than learn how to defeat him. Our weapons may seem ineffective. We, we, we know that God wants the victory, and we're looking for his weapons, but they seem like, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Will this really bring victory? Because I have a better idea. You see, men, we are good at problem solving. At least we think we're good at it. What can't duct tape fix? Right? Is there anything? You got a problem? We can duct tape it. I've seen duct tape bumpers. In fact, I think they tried to duct tape the church bumper that time. No, they didn't. No, we're not good at solving problems, but we think we are. I read a story about a, a woman once who invited a man to live in her home. She was not married to this man. It was ungodly. She invited him in, and after a little while, it was an economical arrangement as the story goes, and she began to feel guilty, began to feel convicted. She was a Christian, began to feel convicted about this. Her conscience began to bother her, and she asked the man to leave, but he refused. Apparently he said to her, you invited me in and I'm not leaving. She said, well, I command you to leave. And the man she invited in the house laughed at her. 
and said, I don't care what you say. You can't make me leave and you can't put me out. She then began to plead with him, would you please leave? And he began, again, refused. He said, I- I'm going to stay. My stuff is here. The lady was so embarrassed, humiliated, and convicted, she didn't know what to do. Finally went to church, and someone there said, listen, we can take care of this problem. So she went to a lawyer, talked to the lawyer and to the judge, and the judge issued an injunction that the man had no legal right to be in her house any longer. He had to move out. She came back to this man and showed him the injunction and said, now you have to leave. He began to cry and howl and to complain. But she stood her ground, her legal ground, and after a lot of protests, he left because he knew he had to go. And sometimes, Christian, my friends, we look at these weapons and we plead on an earthly sense. We beg in, an, in a temporal sense. We command, all right, in our own flesh. You know what? I command these thoughts to be gone. I command, you know what? I'm done with this struggle. I'll never struggle again. I'm done with it. But it will be ineffective. Because we're not called to use earthly and temporal weapons. We're called to eternal and spiritual weapons. And we too often attempt to fight the internal battle with external weapons and earthly weapons. You see, the spiritual weapons are are called things like truth, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We are called to know truth, and truth is one of our spiritual weapons. Truth will help you get over those struggles in your life. The truth from Jesus Christ will bring victory to your life. No amount of resolve will solve your eternal battles. No amount of of character will solve it, but the truth from God's Word will solve your battles. Prayer, worship, the Word of God. I was preparing for this message. I googled how to handle some problems. Internet's a wonderful place filled with bad advice. I googled how to handle depression. I got results upon results. I clicked upon one. Eight ways to handle depression. Now listen, understand, not everything was bad on there, but my favorite tip was this. To handle depression, you need to get a wellness toolbox. Now you know what a wellness toolbox is? Do you know what a wellness toolbox is? Good, neither did I. But they told me what it was. It's an internal toolbox, not an outside toolbox, one for inside. In this inside toolbox, you put nice things for yourself. All right, so that when you're depressed, out of your toolbox, inside of you, pull out the nice tools you need. Really? And how big a toolbox do I need? Uh, who makes it? Is it a snap-on toolbox? All right, is it a craftsman toolbox? Is it, a, is it large? Does it roll around on casters? Or is it like a carrying toolbox? I mean, I'm that kind of guy. What kind of toolbox? Well, well you can't handle depression with a wellness toolbox. I Googled how to handle fear, internal battle, fear. We've got people walking in fear every day in 2020, walking in fear. But fear, it was not created in 2020. Fear has been around. (laughs) Now I'm afraid now. (laughs) Ten ways to deal with fear. My favorite, visualize a happy place. If you visualize a happy place, fear will flee from your life. Now, I like happy places with everybody else. When I think happy place, I think of happy meals. Then McDonald's, and I'm right back into fear. (laughs) My happy place takes me to a sad place. Hopefully you have happy thoughts, but visualizing a happy place will not just make all your fear get driven away out of your mind. I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm somewhere else. I'm somewhere where there's unicorns and butterflies. No, you're not. You're right here. Visualize a happy place. Eleven simple ways to cope with anxiety. That was a good list right there. I'm glad they put simple ways on that. I noticed that level simple ways. You know, eleven complex, confusing ways that you can barely make it but cope with anxiety. Can I handle it? No, eleven simple ways. My favorite there, aromatherapy. Anger, anger. Oh, I like this one. Ten tips to tame your temper. 
10 tips to tame your temper. My favorite one, right? Here it is. Picture a stop sign. <laughs> I'm about to, oh wait, stop sign. Okay. 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 I'm about to kill you now, <laughs> right? Picture a stop sign. Now, I know what they're trying to say, right? Stop your anger. But, but come on, all right? This is what surrounds us and we're guilty of. Picture a stop sign. And if you picture that stop sign, is it like an LED stop sign? Is it red? What side of the road is it on? All right? Then your anger will be gone. But you know what? We cannot, we cannot defeat these internal battles with external methods. Picture a stop sign. I'm going to picture a green light. That's what I'm going to picture. <laughs> I'm going to picture a semi-truck on that green line. I'm going to picture you on the other side of the semi-truck. That's what I'm going to do, and then my anger is out of control, right? Picture a stop sign. I Google bitterness, too. Twelve steps to overcome bitterness. That's a lot of steps. That's a lot of steps. Not three steps. You know, not 11, 12. Twelve steps to overcome bitterness. The one that I thought was most damaging wasn't my favorite. I had a ray of light, a ray of hope. It said, forgive. Well, this will be good. And then right behind it said, forgive, but at your own pace. I've been teaching on forgiveness in Sunday school class, right, young couples? Teach on forgiveness. We often forgive at our own pace. That's the problem. That's why there is bitterness. Because we're forgiven at our own pace. I'll forgive you when I get over this. I'll forgive you when you finally, get, when I think you're sincere. I'll forgive you when you stop doing that. Not I'll forgive you like God forgave me, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. No, we don't forgive that way. We often forgive at our own pace. That's the problem, not the solution. You see, we tempt to fight these spiritual battle with earthly weapons, and our spiritual weapons seem ineffective. So we turn to these directions, and, and almost all of them, they're almost all laughable. How can that help to visualize a happy place and get a wellness toolbox and picture a stop sign and forgive at your own pace? We cannot help but to remain in defeat when we follow these methods. But we have weapons which no human reasonings or workings can withstand. We have the power of God. We have the Spirit of God. And we have the Word of God. We have power that no human can deny or cause to cease. The same power that created this universe, the same power that God used to form everything in the universe, is that same power that is available for you and I to defeat our battles within. That's the power. So while our battles may seem insurmountable and our weapons may seem ineffective, our battles within can be won. Look now, the verse we look here, kind of give you the last little bit. What does the Bible say to do? Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse number five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He tells us to do two things. First thing he says to do is to cast, to cast down. That word cast there in the Greek has the idea to destroy. But it goes beyond destroy. There's lots of ways we can destroy things. My kids can destroy the carpet with their muddy shoes. I can destroy a dish by leaving it in the oven too long. But this idea, this word has the idea to destroy with a vengeance. The idea is that when we attack these things with the grace of God, there's a little bit of an attitude, an authority. This is not a casual set aside. This is not a limited little, let me just move this to the side. This is a, I am out to destroy this particular battle within with a vengeance. Or say it this way, either tear down the imaginations or they will tear you up. Casting down imaginations. You see, this is where often where we fail. We are not casting down, we're constructing. We're not getting rid of our fear. We are feeding our fear. We're feeding it by the choices we make, by what we look at or what we think about. We're allowing the fear to take root. We're not casting it down. We're allowing it to grow in our life. 
We're not trying to cast down the bitterness. We're not bringing in Scripture to, to defeat the bitterness and forgiveness in our spirit. Instead, we're allowing the bitterness to fester and to bring that root even deeper in our life. We're not casting down panic and anxiety. We're dwelling on it. We're allowing it to have more space in our minds. We're not casting down the depressing thoughts. We're dwelling in them. We're thinking on these things. And the place we most often fail is because we're not casting, we're constructing. We have a little garden in our heart of these, of these areas, and we protect that garden. It may be because we think it's too hard to get rid of, or it may be too personal. I don't know what the reason. At the end of the day, we allow them to get stronger. Instead, the Bible says to cast them down. How do you cast down an imagination? A couple different ways. Sometimes... It's verbal. I've been driving down the road and some thoughts will come or some attitude and it's like, this is not pleasing to God. Sometimes I'll say out loud, Lord, I don't want that thought in my head. Sometimes I cast things down out loud. Sometimes you can't really cast it down out loud. You're at the library. Can't talk at the library. People get mad at you. And they don't picture stop signs. It's a dangerous place there. So sometimes it's internal. Lord, you got to help me. I don't want this thought right here. Lord, I want this thought to be gone. I want to cast it down. I want to, though, cognitively use my mind. I want to bring the thought in this and that thought, that pattern, that attitude, that feeling, that emotion. Lord, that doesn't please you. I need it to be gone. I want it to be gone. I want this thing cast down. It cannot have a space in my mind. I'm not going to feed it. I read a story about a man who had an emotional breakdown because of bitterness. He got bitter at his contractor who didn't pour his driveway the right way. Of all the offenses in life, the driveway. He told a, a friend, he said, the problem was the contractor lived next door to me. And every day I saw him, I got angrier and I resented him more. You see, he wasn't casting down those thoughts. He wasn't praying for his enemies or praying for those who have wronged him. He was allowing it to fester. He was fueling it. Someone who wants to cast these thoughts down says, Lord, help me. I don't want that thought in my mind. Lord, I don't want to have any space in my mind. They bring in truth. Sometimes after I do that, I'll begin to quote Scripture. You know, Scripture has a wonderful benefit in your life beyond guidance. It replaces other thoughts. I can put off the old man. I can put on something new. You know it's hard to be mad at somebody when you're quoting Scripture? Try that the next time someone cuts you off. Start to quote Psalm 1. I don't, it doesn't matter what passage you quote. Just quote some Bible. You know what you're going to find? It's hard to be angry while you quote Scripture. And don't quote the Psalms where David prays to rain down fire and judgment on somebody else. <laughs> know what you're thinking. Bunch of heathens. <laughs> quote some Scripture. It's hard to be angry during those times. Casting down those thoughts. Instead of fueling it, cast them down. Cast it down with a little bit of a vengeance. You know what? I'm going to drop kick you into tomorrow. That's what I'm going to do. You're out of here. You're done. Can you imagine if someone, you men, broke into your house tonight and tried to hurt your family? Moms, can you imagine if someone tried to hurt your children? The mother bear syndrome. I remember the first time I, I met face-to-face -face a mother bear as principal of the school. This mom was lashing out at me. I had like an out-of-body experience at that moment. <laughs> I was behind my desk. I remember thinking this, they're mad at me, but why are they mad? Because I'm not part of the problem. I'm kind of part of the solution. I did nothing, in this, but they're so angry. And then it hit me. They're mad for their children. And then this thought struck me that day. Boy, I'm thankful they care so much about their kids. But can you imagine someone trying to hurt your kids, moms? I can imagine. I know you. You wouldn't just say, oh, that's nice. Have a nice day. Oh, that's sweet and special. No, you destroy that person with a vengeance. There'd be no stop sign except in your two hands. <laughs> that's what the Bible says about casting down our imaginations. 
You know the Bible uses that word imaginations because they're not real? Because they're not real. They're not genuine. They're imaginations. It says to cast them down, destroy with a vengeance. You see, if you give Satan a toehold, he'll work it into a foothold. And from there, he'll make a stronghold. I don't want Satan to have a toehold in my life, but he's constantly working for that. And then it says to capture, to bring into captivity. We were kids. We play this game called King of the Hill. And once you're on top of that hill, your job was to keep everyone else from being on top of the hill. And as kids, you have to maintain that King of the Hill. How'd you do that? Well, sometimes you pushed him down the hill, right? That's the best way. Sometimes you dodge him, get it, but you got him out of there. You know what the Bible says here? It says that the knowledge of God must be king of the hill in my life. So anything else, I'm going to capture and take away. You see, there's just place in my life for God's grace. You have anxiety in your life, what's going to happen? The Bible says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You have depression, cast it down. In, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We have anger because we feel God isn't fair. Remember, 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. You have selfishness. Remember the Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So my friend tonight, I wonder, do you have any battles in your life you're facing? Anything inside here? Maybe I've mentioned, maybe I haven't. I have not been all inclusive on purpose. The Bible says our weapons are mighty. They're spiritual. It's the truth and prayer but our responsibility is to cast and to capture. And I wonder tonight if you're facing your battles not with a vengeance, not with an idea to capture this battle, but the idea that you're just going to let it fester and sit. But tonight God can bring victory. He's not left us alone. In fact, he says things like this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says, think on these things. He says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Our battles may seem insurmountable. Our weapons may seem ineffective, but with the grace of God and the strength of God, our battles within can be won. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for the strength and the victory that you offer to us. Lord, help us. Lord, help us not to just build up these things in our life. Lord, but help us with your grace to begin to cast down and bring into captivity with your grace, your truth, or those areas that we've been struggling with. Thoughts that don't please you, Lord. Attitudes, emotions, actions. Lord, may we not live in a contaminated way. Lord, may we live to please you. With head bowed and eyes closed. I wonder who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. There's some things I need to cast down in my heart and life, in my mind. Would you pray for me that I would cast those down and start tonight? I might have to cast them down again tomorrow and tomorrow night and Tuesday and Tuesday. But would you pray for me? God spoke to me as you spoke. When you pray, would you pray for me? He would say, that's me, Pastor. Slip your head, slip back down. Amen. 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 Who else? The battle within I'm facing. God spoke to me. There's some things I need to cast down and capture. Lord, you've seen the hands. You know the hearts. Lord, you know the battles far better than I do. 
or better than we do. Lord, you've promised victory, but you've asked us to do something. Lord, let's cast these things down with your power. Lord, help us. Those who indicated that you touched their heart, Lord, where they respond to you. The piano's already playing. God touched your heart. You stand your feet and the altar's open. you're letting it fester in your mind, in your heart, in your life. instruments are playing victory in Jesus I wouldn't mind singing that tonight would you can we sing that in a spirit of victory I heard old old story how a savior came from glory let's sing it out like we believe it tonight to us. Lord, you brought to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that we can have that victory in our life, Lord, no matter what the problem may be. Lord, may we seek to follow you and, Lord, walk in your truth. Lord, thank you for all you're doing, what you have done in Jesus' name.